I want to talk about something called the method of images, but before I do that, let's just review a few things. The uniqueness theorem for potentials says if you consider a volume V bounded by a surface S, and if the potential V is specified on the surface, then Laplace's equation has a unique solution in the volume. And what is Laplace's equation? That's where you take the del squared operator and act it on the scalar potential V, and you should get zero. Uh, remember that this is a special case of Poisson's equation. So consider this problem. A point charge Q is located a distance A above an infinite grounded conducting plane, and we want to find the potential everywhere above the plane. So here's my infinite conducting plane, and I should define some axes here. We'll say this is the x, y, and z axes, and here's my charge Q, and it's a distance A above the plane. And so we're going to use the uniqueness theorem as a way of figuring out a trick to get the potential everywhere above the plane. So look at what the uniqueness theorem says. So it says if we have a volume bounded by a surface and the potential specified on the surface, then Laplace's equation has a unique solution. So if we can find a solution that matches the boundary conditions, that has to be the right solution because it's a unique solution. There's only one solution. So no matter how you find the solution, that has to be the right one. And that's the idea behind the method of images. Okay, so here's our plane with the charge a distance A above the plane. And here's the problem. And we're going to look at the boundary conditions. And the first boundary condition says that on the plane, the potential is zero. If you look at the problem, it's an infinite grounded conducting plane. So that tells us that the potential is zero everywhere on the plane. Okay. At infinity, the potential should go to zero. Now, if you remember the uniqueness theorem, it said that we have a volume bounded by a surface. Well, if we let our surface sort of uh, be at infinity, then the other boundary condition that we have for the other surface that's not the plane would be that the potential has to vanish as we uh, go off to infinity far, far away from the plane. Okay, so here's the method of images. Consider a similar situation without a conducting plane, but with another and we're going to call it an image charge instead. If it is possible to satisfy the boundary conditions, then the potential above the plane will be the same as it is in the original problem. So we're going to get rid of this conducting plane. We're going to put another charge somewhere else. And if we can get the potential to look like this, uh, these boundary conditions above the plane, then that has to be the right potential for the problem. OK, so here are the boundary conditions. And I'm going to look at a side view here. So here is the z-axis, and this is the conducting plane. That would be uh, in the xy plane. And here's my charge q, a distance a, above the conducting plane. Now, for the method of images, we're going to get rid of the conducting plane. So we're going to pretend that it's not there, look at a completely different situation, but we're still going to try and mimic the boundary conditions that we had before. We want to find something that satisfies these boundary conditions. Okay, so two questions. We want to put a charge somewhere, but how do we know where to put the charge? And also, how do we know the value of the charge? Now, you might be able to guess from symmetry that the charge needs to go somewhere on the z-axis uh, down here. Because if we want this uh, xy plane to have zero potential, the only way that that would work, given that we already have a positive q up here, is to have some kind of charge down here by symmetry. So let's say that we have a charge, I'll call it big Q, and it's a distance h. And we have to figure out what h and q, the big Q, are. Well, let's look at the potential right there at the origin. So if we calculate the potential there, then that would be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And we have two contributions now. We have from the small charge Q, which is a distance A away from the origin, plus the potential due to the large Q, which is a distance H away from the origin. And that has to equal 0 because on the plane, V equals 0. Okay, and then I can rewrite this, uh, get rid of the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and I can solve this for big Q but this big Q still has the H in it. So I want to figure out what the H and the big Q are in terms of the little Q and the A. So I need another equation. 
How about if we look at the potential here? And we'll say that this is a distance d away uh, from the z-axis, somewhere in the xy plane. Okay, the potential there looks like this. So now we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and then we have two contributions again. From the small, uh, the little q, we have the square root of a squared plus d squared. So that's uh, Pythagorean theorem here, getting this distance away if we have a triangle here with uh, a and d as the two sides. And then we have from the big Q, the uh, Q over the square root of H squared plus D squared, same deal, Pythagorean theorem to get that distance right there. And on the plane, V is zero, so we set that equal to zero. And we can solve this. Uh, we can get rid of the one over four pi epsilon naught. And we get another relationship between big Q and H. So now we have two equations and we have to solve these two equations for big Q and H. Okay, so here are the two equations that we want to solve. So let's see, how can we do this? Well, let's look at this equation first here. Maybe uh, we can cross multiply here. So I would get uh, Q squared times H squared plus D squared equals, and big Q squared times A squared plus D squared. Okay, that looks good. And now big Q, is negative uh, little q h over a. I can plug that in for the big Q right here. So I'm going to get big Q, or I'm sorry, little q squared h squared plus d squared equals, and this big Q squared, uh, well, the minus sign will go away, and this will just be little q squared h squared over a squared. And that is times a squared plus d squared. And let's see, uh, I have a Q squared on each side. I can get rid of that. And what else? Let's uh, multiply by A squared. So I have A squared, H squared, plus A squared, D squared equals, and then H squared times A squared, that's A squared, H squared, plus, and then H squared, D squared. And now you see that I have an a squared h squared on both sides, so that will go away. And that will leave me with a squared d squared equals h squared d squared. And now I can get rid of the d squareds. And I see that a equals plus or minus h. But we already decided here that our h uh, is down here, right? So. I'll just say that in magnitude terms here, our h equals a. All right, so that tells us that big Q here is going to be uh, below the plane exactly the same distance that little q was above the plane. Kind of makes sense by symmetry. And now we can figure out what big Q is. Big Q, remember, is uh, negative little q h over a. And that means that this is negative Q, what's H? H is A, okay, A over A, and the A's cancel, and I'm left with negative Q. So what I see is that I have this uh, big Q here that is gonna end up being the uh, equal and opposite to the uh, Q above here, and the same distance below the plane that this was above the plane, and this all kind of makes sense from symmetry. So let's go ahead and place that on our graph here. So we have a negative Q that is a distance A below the XY plane. Now remember, we don't have a conducting plane here anymore. We have an XY plane, but we don't have a conducting plane. We just have the two charges. So if I look at the two charges here, I can calculate the potential above the plane. So the formula for the potential, we would need the potential due to each charge here. So I have a uh, Q here, which I'll say is a distance uh, R plus away from the point, maybe this is some point P that we're trying to calculate the potential. So R plus would be that, that distance here. And then we have our negative Q and R minus would be that distance here. And remember that this is the XY plane here. So this point P has coordinates uh, X, Y, Z. It's somewhere out in outer space here and X, Y, Z space here. And we wanna figure out uh, the potential at that point P. So to do that, we need to know what R plus and R minus are. So here are the coordinates of P. Here's the coordinates of positive Q, that would be 0, 0, A. And the coordinates of negative Q, that would be 0, 0, negative A. And I can use the distance formula in uh, three dimensions to get the distance from the positive Q to point P 
and the distance from the negative q to point p. So r plus, that's the distance from the positive q to point p, would look like the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z minus a squared. And then r minus, that's the distance from the negative charge to point p. That looks like the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z plus a squared. And I can plug this into the potential formula. So I get something that looks like this. And this is my potential anywhere above the plane. So that's uh, anywhere up here and at some point P, for instance. Okay, well, let's check to make sure that this potential satisfies the boundary conditions. We have two conditions, on the plane, V equals zero. Well, on the plane, that means Z equals zero for on the plane. And indeed, if you set Z equal to zero in this formula here, you do end up getting uh, that V equals zero, if you think about z equaling zero here, then we'll have negative a squared. Well, same thing as a squared. And if I set z equal to zero here, I get a squared. And these two terms will be identical. And since we're subtracting them, v will indeed equal zero. So that works. How about the second boundary condition? Well, it says at infinity, v has to approach zero. Well, it's the same thing as saying that uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared has to be a lot greater than a squared to be infinitely away. And when that happens, v should approach zero. And if you think about it, that's just really uh, saying that these denominators here, um, this x squared plus y squared plus uh, z squared here is much, much larger than a squared. The denominators will get really big. And so we will end up having something really small. And so this whole thing will indeed approach zero. So this seems to work. Now remember what the uniqueness theorem says. If we can find a potential that meets the boundary conditions, then that has to be the right potential for that area. We did it. We found a potential. We didn't do it by considering a conducting plane, but it doesn't matter. It still is the right potential for the situation of a point charge above a grounded conducting plane. So, some observations here. We want to use the boundary conditions to find the location and the magnitude of the image charge. And that was pretty easy to do with a grounded conducting plane, but the same principle applies for more complicated situations. And you cannot place image charges in places where you want to calculate the potential. So anytime you're trying to solve a problem by method of images, all of the image charges have to go somewhere other than the volume where you want to calculate the potential. The image charge has the opposite sign of the charge in the problem. If you notice, we had a positive charge above a grounded conducting plane, and our image charge ended up being negative. The potential of the image charge configuration must satisfy the boundary conditions. Otherwise, you can't use the uniqueness theorem, and you can't guarantee that you have found the right potential. So the method of images is a little bit of a trick. It's not something you can use all the time. The problem has to be able to uh, have a certain kind of symmetry or some way that you can figure out uh, a way to put the image charges down to get the right potential. But when you can use it, it can really simplify the problem.